Firstly, I'm going to, to tell you how uh, various definitions that relate to genetics and rare diseases apply to lupus. I'm then going to give you a typical clinical case. So this is based on somebody that I've looked after in the kidney clinic uh, who has lupus to give you an idea of the impact that this disease can have. So it uh, can be a pretty devastating disease. So I'm then going to talk to you about how we can, uh, things that we can surmise from the clinical features about the etiology, then talk about pathogenic mechanisms and particularly focus on how mouse models have allowed us to define some aspects of the um, pathogenesis. Then talk about abnormal B cell activation and then finally how we've used some of the information from mouse models to define uh, new therapeutic options for patients with lupus. Okay, so in terms of definition, so you're here as rare disease MPhil students, uh, and you will have heard already that we define a rare disease as a disease that affects less than one in 2,000 of the population. And, and so formally, there are at least 6,000 diseases that have been defined as rare diseases, but you can see that that would change depending on what your baseline population is, because there are some diseases that are more common uh, in some populations. And Overall, although these diseases individually might be relatively rare, they affect a lot of people in the UK, so um, more than 3 million. So lupus is a, a polygenic autoimmune disease, and you, you've heard a little bit about one of these already. You've heard about inflammatory bowel disease. And what we mean by that is that unlike monogenic diseases, for someone to get lupus, they have to have abnormalities or genetic variants in more than one gene that together contribute to the development of disease. And so these individual variants are often, if you looked in the general population, they are often relatively common, um, but it's only if you line them up, and, and, in, and in isolation they don't necessarily cause disease. So it's only if you line them up uh, in a particular way that they will cause disease in an individual. So um, for lupus, it's, it's rare, so it affects about 3 in 10,000 people in a Caucasian population. Actually, for a Southeast Asian population, it's more common than that, and, there are, and that's driven by genetics. Uh, in terms of the genes or the loci that have been implicated, there are more than 50 susceptibility loci that have been implicated. So you can see that if I was to describe the the studies that have been done for each of these, we'd be here a very long time. So I've just taken a sample of each of these. Okay, so um, why, why do people find this disease interesting? Why, why do I find it interesting as a clinician? So to convey this to you, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a clinical case. So this is a 24-year-old lady who presented with a rash. Um, and this rash had principally been across her face. Uh, but also she'd noticed some rash on the back of her hands as well, so in, you, you could say, sun-exposed areas. She'd had some intermittent chest pain, which she described as sharp, and in, in medicine we know the significance of that is that sharp chest pain that's worse when you breathe in is called pleuritic chest pain, and it usually means there's some sort of inflammation in the pleural membranes, so pleurisy. And she'd also just generally not been feeling well for about three months, so she'd had lethargy um, and also joint pains, particularly in the small joints of her hands. So as is usual, we go on to, to take a history from patients when they come to us with a problem, and um, that includes asking about their past medical history, and actually, you know, this lady was relatively young and had previously been completely fit, so had not had problems. The only uh, medicine she was taking was the oral contraceptive pill, and she ha actually had no family history of disease. So you, you will have learnt already that it's important to take a family history um, in patients who present with diseases, so particularly ones that you think might have a genetic etiology. So this is, this is the rash that she had. Um, and this sort of rash has been dubbed as a butterfly rash. So you can see why it sort of has the, the shape of a, a butterfly. So we went on to do a number of blood tests, the sort of simple blood tests that you do. Um, uh, one of them was to look at whether she was anemic, and in fact she was. Her white blood cell count uh, was at the top end of normal, and her platelets, which are responsible for helping the blood clot, were on the lower side. But um, what was more worrying was when we looked at her kidney function tests, and to do this we, take, we, we look at something called creatinine, which is a waste product that's removed by the kidneys. 
And uh, so therefore, if your kidney's not working so well, the level of creatinine goes up. And when we looked at the level of that, that was actually higher than it should be for someone of that age, suggesting that her kidney function was impaired. And to go along with that, when we dipped the urine, we could find both blood and protein in it. And, and those things, are, although that seems like nothing too much, that's actually highly significant in a, in a young female and suggests there might be inflammation. OK, so how can we identify the genes that are involved, broadly speaking? So a genome-wide association study, um, which is what we can do now, when people started investigating this, that wasn't available, but a genome-wide association study where basically you take a group of patients with disease, a group of controls that are of the same um, uh, racial origin, and you uh, have the capacity to look for the presence of literally hundreds of thousands of different SNPs, so single nucleotide variants, and you're able to say, are there some that are more common in the uh, cases and more common in, uh, are less common in the controls? Um, so to date, and, I, and um, I, I actually was going to tell you about some of the GUS stuff, then I cut it out. I was already had too much to tell you about. But there have actually been now more than 10 GWSs, so, and this has really happened in the last, you know, five, six, seven years. There have been more than 10 GWSs that have looked at uh, lupus populations on various different genetic backgrounds. Um, and perhaps I'll just summarise and say that, 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 unsurprisingly, one of the key variants that's come up are variants in MHC, so class 2 which um, are involved in antigen presentation, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that, why that might be important later. We can also get some idea about genetic variation, if you think about it, indirectly. And actually, many times in medicine, we have started here with protein biomarkers, because if you think about it, right, what, what we're trying to look at is genes that are transcribed and then translated to become proteins. So you can actually assay someone's proteins and say what's different, and that can give you an idea about genetic variation. And you might argue that unless a genetic variant has an impact on the level or the type of protein, that it may not matter, and that's probably true in lots of cases. So I think studies that look at, at proteins can also be helpful. And then also, you can indirectly look at genetic variation by looking at the mRNA species. And, and people have done that now quite extensively because you can, again, do it on a platform where you can look at hundreds of thousands of different transcripts. Um, and, and those, you know, I've got to say transcriptomics, and you can do transcriptomics on peripheral blood, and people have done that in lupus. Um, and you can do it on biopsies as well, and again, people have done that. And that, again, I don't have time to tell you about those studies, but really the, those have also, using the transcriptome, to tell you something about genetic variation has been useful in lupus and identified the type 1 interferon signature. So there's a paper from uh, Bonchereau and, and colleagues in the New England Journal a, a long while ago now. But so I think when you're thinking about how you can assay a person with disease in terms of their genetic variation, don't just think about directly looking at genes, but think about the fact that um, both the mRNA and the protein can also give you an insight into genetic variation. But what has been um, more effective in targeting clinically is the BAF pathway. Um, and one particular drug, so um, an antagonistic BAF antibody called belimimab, that's made by GSK, has been used in a number of trials. And I, I gave you one of the key phase three trials in your, um, in your reference list. And basically, um, the data using belimumab shows that it's certainly more effective than, than standard of care, which is the things I mentioned, like cyclophosphamide. And obviously, comes without the price for the future of uh, an impact on, on future malignancy. And I should have said also, cyclophosphamide has severe effects on fertility. And since I told you that, you know, nine to one female to male ratio, that makes a, a big difference. So this has really been big news. So belimumab is the first drug to be li new drug to be licensed for lupus in 50 years. So you know this was um, uh, a real turning point in um, the treatment of lupus. Okay, so we've made it, and there hasn't been too much sleepiness. Uh, so hopefully I've convinced you that lupus is clinically heterogeneous, and it's such an interesting disease that I think there possibly might be more people investigating its pathogenesis than there are people who have it.
Um, both genetic and environmental factors contribute to disease susceptibility, and I could have given you a whole lecture about the environmental factors, uh, perhaps another time. Um, we've been able to use spontaneous mouse models and um, mouse knockout models to identify genes and polymorphisms. And, and I would say more than any other disease, they've been just so useful in, in identifying underlying pathways. What we do know is that B cells play an absolutely central role, and this has actually made a difference to patients because we've been able to begin to target B cells with monoclonal antibodies to produce treatments that are more specific and, more importantly, less toxic for the young women that get the disease. So there we go.